If you love ancient history, then this is the channel for you. History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but dedicated just to ad-free history documentaries, including a huge library of ancient history content from the Ninth Legion to Boudicca to the First Britons. Now you can get a huge discount on History Hit TV today. Simply check out the details in the description below and make sure you use code Odyssey on sign up. Anyways, on with the show. Back in the Bronze Age, about 1800 BC, a group of people died here at Leven in Fife. We know that because of these, eight tiny graves in a small cemetery. But what we don't know is who these people were. Were they members of the same family or of the same tribal group? How did they die? Were they buried with any grave goods? This ancient burial ground is of great archaeological importance, but it's under threat from a building development. Over the next few months, this entire field will be covered in houses. So we've been given the rare opportunity to find out as much as we can about the people who lived and died here nearly 4,000 years ago. And we've got just three days to excavate this entire cemetery before the archaeology is lost forever. Time Team have in the past taken on some ambitious excavations, but here we may have bitten off more than we can chew. Only three days to totally excavate each grave, record and remove all of the archaeology before the builders move in. Because the site has to be completely cleared, it offers us a rare opportunity to archaeologically dismantle the graves to find out as much as we can about their structure and occupants but there's potentially a very big problem. The soil here is very acidic, which means that any skeletal remains and grave goods could have been completely destroyed. You started without us. Absolutely, well, we've not so much started without you. We've actually already evaluated the site, so we've dug it before. We've just actually cleaned up the site again so we can start the excavation proper now. And where are the actual graves? Well, you can see quite a few just coming up around us. We've got a grave just here in front of us, one immediately in front of this girl here, and this large boulder you see in the middle probably caps quite an important grave. It's yet to be tested, but it seems likely. You weren't calling them graves. What was the word you used? Kissed. They're kist burials. What does that mean? Which, well, it's a, it's a kind of a, arrangement of stone slabs forming the edges of the burial. And the burials, the skeletons, or the cremations as they might be, are actually put inside. How did you find this place originally? Well, we had a suspicion that there might be some graves in this area, principally because of a chance discovery made back in 1944. So when this area actually came up for development, we thought, aha, there's a good possibility that we're going to find more kists here, so let's have a look. So when we undertook an evaluation here about a month or so ago, as soon as we stripped back the soil, we found the first kist, and then another, then another, then another, and then clearly we realised we were dealing with a cemetery. This part of eastern Scotland has got a huge amount of Bronze Age activity, each of these dots representing artefacts and single burials. And our site in Leven is possibly the largest Bronze Age cemetery ever found in Scotland. From the previous evaluation, we know of nine separate kists, and Phil's already nabbed what looks like the best one. Well, this is quite a moment, Tony, because this is the most complete one we've got. This is the only one that's still got this enormous capstone. It's really well sealed, isn't it? How are you going to get it off? Well, we've got to literally reconstruct what they did and dismantle it in reverse. So the last stone that they put in is the first one that we take out. Mm -hmm. This stone here, for example, you can see it's well and truly on top of the capstone. So that one can come. It looks very fragile stuff. It's, it's not very good stone. Um, we must 
make absolutely sure there's no detail carvings or anything on the undersides of these. But it's very, very rotten. You can see it's it's very, very laminated. Look, it just you see it's it's very, very rotten stone. But obviously did the purpose. What do we do with this rock? Is it worth holding on to? Well, obviously, if there was any of it that's got any signs of working on, then we'd keep that. But but this stuff, it's just, it's just stones, basically. We'll just chuck so it on the spoil we, This can all go. None of the other kists seem to have lids, so we can use different digging strategies for each to try and find out as much as we can about how they were constructed. What we'd like you to do is to cut a slot on the far side and to try and take out this long stone here, which will give us a view through the kist and a sense of how the kist has been filled in. Oh, excellent. So we're going to get quite a nice view of the stratigraphy. Of hopefully, hopefully. At the very centre of the cemetery, leading Bronze Age expert Francis Pryor has already started digging around the mysterious rock. This is an incredible looking thing you've got here. It looks so significant. Is it just a coincidence? No, I, I think this is the heart of the site. I mean, forget all those graves and things. I mean, this large lump of rock is, is the key to it all. What do you think it might be? Well, we'll know that when we've dug out the pit into which it was sunk, which I've marked out with my trowel. So let's have a look. The pit goes all the way goes around all the here. Way around. Yeah. That's it, and then we pick it up here. That's so it. you think the pit was dug first and then this was put into it, so it wasn't here when the first burials were done? Well, what I would like is that the pit is much earlier than the burials and that this was a sacred site for centuries before they started coming here with the burials. That would be lovely because it would show that this particular bit of land had always been important. So might this even be Stone Age? Well, it could, yeah, it could be. Yes, why not? And well, there might actually be a body under there. Oh, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? <laughs> that it could would be something, my day. though. Well, it could be, yeah, it could be. It just depends how deep it goes, and we don't know how far that rock's going to go. And what's this here? Well, that is a, is a spread of burning. It's a lot of burning on the site. And what's fascinating about that is that the burning there is cut by the pit. So what does that mean? That means that the burning has got to be earlier than the pit. I reckon there's something strange going on here. Maybe they were cleansing the site in some way. You know, maybe there were trees here and they had to be burned and sort of disposed of in the correct way. Because there are lots of patches of this burning Absolutely. all over the place, aren't there? 215. Geophys are conducting a magnetic susceptibility survey, which should, by measuring variations in magnetism in the ground, prove whether these black areas are indeed burning. Two, one, five. Even though the nine kists were only discovered a month ago, this field has turned up Bronze Age archaeology in the recent past. When did your dad discover the first kist? In early 1944, when a plough nicked the top of one of the covering stones. And you saw it? Yep. I was brought down at the age of five. So it's uh, a little time ago. A little, a little bit ago. But I was, um, I'm rather hazy about what I saw. I do remember seeing a, one of the kists opened. No, it wasn't being opened, it had already been opened, but there were four red sandstone sides to it. How long after your dad discovered it was it actually excavated? It was found in January, and uh, the excavation happened in June. So what happened to the site between the beginning of the year and July? It was left open. It's quite possible some of the artefacts had uh, disappeared. But when the excavation actually took, eventually took place, they found a, a black jet bead and uh, some bones. The bones were analysed and found to belong to a 12-year-old boy. Quite why he was buried with a necklace made of Yorkshire jet and obviously highly prized, we'll never know. We should be able to find whatever remains of his grave somewhere in our cemetery. Alice is excavating two small kists to the east of the big stone. Could they also be the graves of children? You're well underway, and uh, I think we probably need to 
pause and take stock because yeah. this is not quite what we expected. It looks to me a little bit as if we've got the, the natural subsoil already showing through here. There's a definite which, change. I yeah. come down on this and it's sort of quite sandy. I mean, one possibility that occurs to me, given how small the kist is, mm. is that it might actually be a cremation with the bone well burnt. I think the sides are obviously a lot higher yeah. than, than what they are now. I think the, this was actually probably part of the side. It was lying flat yes. on top of the grave, but I think it's probably part of that side that's yeah. been knocked sideways. I, I, I think a good thing to do at this stage would be to have a general clean-up, yeah. uh, not just inside, but actually around the edge as well, and to bring up the cut into which the stones of the kist have been laid. It's disappointing that these two kists turn out to be empty, their stone slabs probably trashed by centuries of ploughing. They could be cremations, or perhaps they contain the remains of tiny babies, the bones being completely destroyed by the acid soil. You kind of get the impression that underneath all this, there ought to be a big void, don't you? Yes. You know what I mean? And you kind of lift, you, know, you just lift the capstone off, and there is this kind of thing underneath, this empty tomb with a with a with with, with a body or something like that underneath. But the reality is, it's much more likely, presumably, just to be down on, on the, earth. The reality is, it's going to be filled up with dirt. Yeah, yeah. On the other side of the cemetery. Cat successfully excavated around one of the side slabs of her kist. It's time to see if the application of a little brute force can shift it. Yeah, and you're, you're going to work the stone free from the other side? Yeah. OK. Go on, that'll go easily. There you go. Oh, it's going. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, very nice. And we've saved the section. It's all there. Lovely job. And it's intact. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. With the side stone removed, Cat will be able to clean up the section to try and understand how the kist filled up with earth, covering whoever and whatever was buried inside. So, Francis, this looks very promising. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. It looks like sandstone, doesn't it? Well, I think that's what we've been waiting for all afternoon here. We've been wondering what this large stone's about, and I think you've just got the answer here. I'd be extremely surprised if that's not the side stones of a kist coming up now there. I yeah. think we've got the grave underneath this that we all thought might be here, but certainly your work there in the last few minutes, I think it's just sealed that one. Yeah, yeah. It does seem very flat, the bottom of that stone, which again fits in with what you... It does indeed. This is cracking, isn't it? It's also such a yeah. sizeable cut. You know, it's a good two to three times the size of any of the other graves on this site. So I'm assuming, being the central focus as well, this is the... The most important, perhaps, possibly. This will be the big cheese. Uh, I think we'd have to conclude that at this early <laughs> stage. <laughs> so the giant stone seems to be sitting on top of soil, which is on top of a large red sandstone kist. You got it? Now let me put mine in, let me put mine in. It's finally time to lift the lid off Phil's grave. Yeah. I'll just, look. It's rotten. That's better, that's better, that's better. Now, all we gotta do is try and slide this up. Reckon we can do it, Karen. That's it. Fingers. Well done. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that black. Does that look like burning to you? Yeah. Hell of a lot. More dark soil. But this time on the inside of the kist. Could this be ritual cleansing of the cemetery as well? Just see if that's burning, Phil. Do you want me out of the way? No, you're okay. okay. Where you've got something that's highly fired, you get really high readings, and that's giving average readings, if not low suggests to me that that's just, not actually burning. So in other that's words, just a some sort organic of... residue okay. below the stone. Okay. So if it's not burning, what is it? We're going to take samples for lab analysis.
It's the end of day one, and I don't think I've ever seen so many of our archaeologists working on their own on a site. They've each been allocated their own grave, and they know they're really up against it for time now to see if they can work out over the next two days what's buried down there, and also to see if they can understand what's underneath that mysterious stone right in the middle of the cemetery. Join us after the break. Beginning of day two at our amazing Bronze Age burial site here at Leven in Scotland. And the big news is that already this morning, this beautiful rim of some kind of Bronze Age pot has been uncovered. That's not all though. Behind us, cats beavering away in a grave over there. Alice is excavating this one down here. In about an hour, we're going to lift the stone right in the middle of the cemetery. We hope to find something intriguing under there. We've got one, two, three more graves here. The whole thing is riddled with potential, Phil. Have you got anything at all in your grave yet? Of course I have, Tony. I am so chuffed. I've actually just got our first bit of human bone. I've actually got down onto the skull. Where is it? There it is, just poke it, poking out of the section there. Now, it's in not in very good condition, but the main thing is I've actually got human remains in these graves. Until you find it, you don't actually know whether the soil conditions would have destroyed all the bone completely. Now we know we've got bone in this one, we could have bone in all the rest of them. Margaret, it's a very small grave. Is this a child? Not necessarily. It could be a child, of course, but it could be an adult in a crouched position. Phil needs to finish off before we can know. How long till we know? Well, I've recorded the section. We want to sample it and then I can take the rest out and then I go down on top of the burial. How long? Well, <laughs> go away and I'll tell you, it will speed me up. <laughs> Give us a shout when you've got something. As Kerry cleans back around the pot in his kist, he starts to uncover a skull and possibly some grave goods. Phil, do you want to come and have a look at this? I've got some flint. A flint? Flint. Oh, I'll have a look at the flint. Got this on the opposite side to the um, vessel here. Good God. God, that is gorgeous. I mean, not only is it gorgeous as a tool, I mean, it's a beautiful big long blade that's been retouched along the edge as a knife. But the thing that really knocks me sideways is the quality of the raw material. I mean, you don't get flint like that up here. Douglas, where's your nearest source of flint from here? Well, certainly we've got nothing of the quality of this kind of flint around here. There's nothing like that in Scotland. I mean, this is possibly Yorkshire, Norfolk, something like that, but it's certainly travelled a long way to get here. I tell you what, even in England, it's rare to get uh, raw material of that quality. Mm. That is the most efficient tool you're likely to get. And you can have it, like, just hold it like that, or you could slot it into a wooden handle or something, glue it in there. It's the most gorgeous thing. Absolutely, but look at the context. We've got a particularly high-status burial here. I mean, this food vessel with a the package there with a the flint knife, an extraordinarily rare find indeed. I tell you what, when I go, you can put me down with one of these. <laughs> I'll be gone. <laughs> God. You see the target ahead, Francis? Oh, yeah. yeah. A few hundred metres to the north of our site, there's more Bronze Age archaeology, which could be evidence of some sort of settlement. It's really? like a good standing stone, doesn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> it's only the top of what it used to be. Used really? To be twice as high. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yes, yeah. it'd been knocked down, I think, probably in about the 40s or so. Yes, I mean, an awful lot of effort went into putting this up. I mean, imagine it twice the size. You know, I mean, the, you're, you're talking about possibly, you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of people coming here to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a major bit of communal work, I think. Yeah. And um, I think they, they, it, it was there for a purpose. And, it, and, and I think the best, the best purpose is that it's, it's territory. Mm. You know, we're on this side, you're on that side. We're probably very good friends, yeah. but, you know, the landscape's got to be parceled <laughs> up, right. hasn't it? In the same field as the standing stone, Peter's found several small stone objects that he'd like identified. I, mean, I was wondering if that was um, possibly extremely old. It or, is. Or I think it's extremely old, yeah. <coughs> it's, uh, it's the way it's, that hole's been made. As you can see, you can put your finger through it. But it's been cut from both, both sides, drilled from both sides, like an hourglass. I think that's uh, possibly a, a mace head or something like that. Certainly prehistoric. Oh, that's fascinating. And uh, this thing has caught my eye. If you actually look at it, it's very, very smooth there. If you'd like to feel that. Can you? Yeah, that's amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 And uh, I think that was used as a, as a corn 
grinding stone, the top stone of a quern. You went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, leaning down on it, and that's what smooths that surface. This, to me, looks to be a rather exciting find. I, you see, this one's got the, the hole in the top, Peter, as well, this sort of cup yep. that's cut in here, but it's not been dressed in any way. It's not yeah. smooth like the one you've got there, Francis. Mm. I think this is portable rock art prehistoric rock art. So in the upland zones they, there's many examples of what's called cup and ring art. They're mm. small hollows cut into the surfaces of rocks and stones and in some cases you get them on, on portable stones, literally mm. just one cup and that can then be deposited either with a burial or in a field boundary, some yeah. kind of symbol that can be put in the ground. I think that's rather an exciting that's find. Actually. Fascinating. Neil, there's one thing that intrigues me almost as much as the graves, and that's these mysterious patches of black yeah. that are coming up all over the site. Are they burning, John? Well, they are burning. They are burnt, but they're not really what we're looking for. What do you mean? Well, we're looking for fired areas. Like pyres? Pyres, pyres, that's it. Yeah. And they're, they give really strong magnetic responses, responses like that. So we've got one? No, we haven't. That's actually the, the igneous rock in the middle of the site. I mean, it's the same effect, but it's natural. So does that mean that at some time there was some kind of sacrificial burning on that stone? No, it, that's the built-in magnetism. When it was a molten rock, it was really high temperatures. And when it's sort of solidified, then it's retained its magnetism, and that's why it's a strong signal. So it's perfectly natural. So we haven't got any pyres on this site? No pyres at all. And when you actually look at where the kists are, near to the kists, you get these areas of yellow areas of burning. Mm. And they're one-off events, though. So would you speculate that what it means is that as each person was buried, there was some sort of fire process associated with yes, that? Yes, I mean, it's possible there are cremations on the site and then we're not really seeing the bone. It's possible there's funerary feasting, which is represented by fires and they're yeah. one-offs. It's possible there are burnt offerings associated with the burial process, but they're all pretty small-scale fires. That's, that's what the evidence that's is the suggesting. Yeah. What we do know is that there wasn't one kind of ritual place where bodies were burned. Well, the one big uncertainty about the evidence that's coming from the Mag Sus, it seems to me, is this impression that we're getting that underlying all of the burials is this great big burnt event, which doesn't mm. seem to be showing up at all. This is Francis's idea that you've got this sort of ritual cleansing by fire. And we're certainly seeing our kists and our mounds going in on top of that right the way across the site. But that's not showing up on this survey. So that's mm. pure speculation. It yeah. is. There's a lot of speculation <laughs> in that. Yeah. The bones in Kerry's kist are fragmentary, but the skull gives Margaret all the information she needs. We've got the skull of a very small child or a baby. Now that looks to me like an adult skull. No, what you've got is with um, young skulls, because the sutures are unfused, as soon as they, everything decomposes, they fall apart and the pressure of the soil just pushes them flat against the, the soil. How do you know and that's a baby and bigger. not an adult? It's very, very thin. Um, the sort of texture of the bone, the configuration of the bone, um, suggests it's somebody who's very young. Another child's grave. The second on the site if you include the 1944 excavation. The third or fourth if you include Alice's tiny kists yesterday. Over in Cat's Trench here, is this another burial? Well, what we've got here, which is really interesting, is um, some cremated material coming at the fill but it is cremated bone and it's it's probably human but what's very very interesting about it is you've actually got marks on it you've got these series of horizontal cuts going across it initially I thought maybe they were the marks you get when bone fractures during cremation but they're not they're the wrong shape they're too even too uniform so something was done to that bone before cremation which is rather strange because if they've been defleshing then the bone wouldn't cremate because you'd never get the thing to a high enough temperature. Part of the cremation process relies on the body catching fire and then continuing to burn, literally under its own steam. So have you any idea what might have caused no, those marks? No, no. I mean, they're obviously caused by some sort of processing, but it just seems slightly odd that they're also cremated. The idea of body processing could very well tie in with Neil's speculation about burial rituals which, in addition to fires or feasting, may now have to include deliberate defleshing. 
half past two, day two. We're well on the way to having excavated all our tiny little graves, but now the moment that we've all been waiting for, we're going to shift the big stone in the middle of the cemetery. So everyone's going to have to clear out the way. Alice, can you clear now? Cat! We're moving this in now. Jim, can you clear? Stop. Hold it, Dennis. Okay. Try that. You get a plank under there, Tony? It's got to come higher. It's got to come much higher than that. It's got to come higher. That's yep. it. That's it. That's it. Okay. Right, you get some straps on. One, two, three. There we go. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's all you two. <laughs> Okay, watch out that bloody thing drops. Get the planks away. We know from yesterday that below the oddly shaped capstone, there's at least a foot of soil above the kist. The digger's priority is to remove the soil as quickly as possible so we can get an idea of the scale of the obviously huge red sandstone lid. Kerry's kist has been recorded. It's time to lift the grave oh, that's goods. A beauty. That's there you go. Well, it's um, it's a Yorkshire vase food vessel, and it's actually very, very similar to one of the ones that was found in the evaluation. So if I uh, hold this beside it, you can see it's the same shape, it's the same twisted cord impressions, and this is very exciting because one of our issues is to see whether we can identify the work of individual potters. Yeah, see if this is a twin pot. Were they made by the same person? Were the people buried at the same time? Post-excavation analysis seems to indicate that the two pots were indeed made to the same design by the same potter in 2100 BC. As Kerry removes the remains of the child's skeleton, a small find comes to light among the teeth. Wow, so it's a bead. Yeah, that is, it's really exciting, isn't, isn't it? Amazing. I mean, it certainly isn't one of these barrel-shaped or oval jet beads. Yeah. And, uh, I wonder very much what it's made of. I don't think we'll be able to tell until Dana has had a look at it, cleaned it up and yeah, looked it yeah. under the microscope. And it certainly feels like stone to me. Uh, but it's very interesting and it's nice that you found it in situ under yeah, the... Yeah, so, so it's, it's a necklace the rather than yeah. you know, yeah. a bracelet bead or whatever. So that's great. So just find me a few more, will you? <laughs> Place your order here. <laughs> This is an extraordinarily rich grave for a child, with a flint knife, bead and decorated pot. So as not to miss these very small finds, every bit of spoil from every kist is being sieved, and odd things are turning up everywhere. And you kind of think to yourself, is that a stone with a groove in it? <laughs> well, it is mm. a stone with a yeah. groove in it, but... I mean, it is incredibly polished, it's isn't it? It's some sort of little tool, or it was used in a workshop for making something. In the incident room, we've set up a small conservation lab where Dana can get to work on the finds. Firstly, to sample the contents of the pot from Kerry's kist. If it contained food or drink, lab analysis may be able to differentiate mead from beer or meat from vegetable matter. She then starts on the supposed bead to find out how it was made. I've cleaned it from each end and it is hollow, so I guess oh, it was a bead, eh? Great, that's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. But it looks as if it's quite un uneven inside, as if yeah. it's... Yeah? I don't see any evidence of drilling. Nope. So I think it's a na it's natural, isn't it? It's a natural freak that's been used as an mm. amulet. That's, mm. that's great. And that's, that's similar to this other stone. Yeah. yeah? So, so we've got this in two different kiss, un unusual stones. I mean, one uses jewellery and this one which seems to be yeah. perhaps just carried around or... I mean, yeah, well, I, I, I think the, you know, the shine that you get on that, I suspect it's mm. been on somebody's body, you know, mm. or in a pouch, and it's, it's a treasured amulet, a good luck charm. I mean, it's been suggested mm -hmm. it's a fertility symbol. Yeah, what why do you not? Think? Yeah. I was <laughs> <laughs> well, it's as good a theory as any, I suppose. Back on site, Phil's ready to lift his skull, but it requires careful wrapping first. What kind of things are you hoping are preserved? Well, it would be really nice if there's some teeth, then we can get an age done. 
and possibly any evidence of disease or anything. But at the moment, it doesn't even look as though we can determine sex. It's in such poor condition, which is why we need to hang on to every scrap of evidence that we've got. And there's been no other bone that's come out apart from this? Not a scrap, no. This is, this is all we've had. And I suppose it does raise the sort of question, you know, in, the, in, the, in Kerry's grave, we have, we've only got skull as well. They've been assuming that the other bones have rotted away. Yeah, Is there the possibility yeah. that they only buried well, the skulls? I think you have to sort of, if this happens, I think again, then we have to actually wonder why. The thing with Phil's is it's in such appalling condition, it's more than plausible that everything else could have completely dis dissolved and, and gone. But the bone that we do have in Kerry's grave is in really good condition on, on the skull, and yet there's absolutely nothing else, and that's a little bit odd. There's a number of mysteries coming out of yeah, these graves, Yeah, there aren't are, they? actually. They really are. Quite weighty, I'll tell you that. Due to the higher density of bones in the human skull, they tend to survive the burial environment much better than any of the other 200-odd bones in the human skeleton. Yeah. Let's pack it back round. Pack it round there. But with no other bones to work with, the skull is our only chance to find out the age and sex of the burial. Dana. Something Hello. for you. Something from, as it's from you. It's, it's yeah. something bone like. It's Yorick. <laughs> it's, the, it's the skull from Phil's trench. And it's oh. in such poor condition hmm. that we've just lifted it in a block and it needs dismantling so that we have as much bone in one piece as possible, if that's possible. OK. <laughs> Let's have a go. No bone, no teeth. No bone, no teeth. Disappointingly, there's so little of the bone left that there's no way of knowing whether this is the skull of an adult or child, man or woman. Back on site, a very rare site, Geophys doing manual work. With their mag survey complete, they've been given the job of trying to find out if there's a perimeter ditch running round the edge of our cemetery. All day long, while we've been working on these fascinating burials and excavating these beautiful pots and skulls and little bits of tooth, we thought that maybe deep in the heart of this cemetery there would be something special, something very important. But we could never have guessed that it would be as significant and as beautiful as this. This is either one of the biggest Bronze Age kists ever discovered in the country or else it's something far, far older, possibly even Stone Age. And the answer to what it is lies down here somewhere. If you're not doing anything after the break, please join us. Beginning of day three, we all got here early because we've got to finish the excavation of this Bronze Age cemetery by tonight. We were all really excited about the possibility of lifting these red stones to see what might be underneath. But everything's changed. We've got these two parallel blue lines right the way through the site. Francis has moved away from the stones. Phil's come across here from the other end of the site. What's going on, Francis? <laughs> well, we realised at the last minute that that central grave, as we thought it was, isn't central. We found a ring ditch that goes around the outside. That central grave is off-centre, so it can't be the main focus of the site. But we thought the stones were at the centre of the site. Where is the centre? The centre is over there. Follow the blue strings. Yeah. The centre is about here. So what we're doing, we're putting a trench right through the centre of the mound, OK? Hopefully we'll find a central grave if there is one. Then we'll understand the site. Right now we're circling around in a great mass of mound. One small question. We've got yeah. something like nine graves to excavate. Yeah. You've now put in this massive trench. Yeah. We've got to have this whole site excavated by the yeah. end of the day. Can we possibly do it? Well, I think it's going to be a tall order. I think it's going to be a very tall order. Henry, yep. Francis has just changed our entire strategy because he thinks the centre of the cemetery isn't where we thought it was, and no. also because he says that he reckons there's a ditch all the way round it. Yeah. Is he right? Well, we, we've seen the ditch on this side, and I've, I've surveyed that in along this edge. Now, if you ex ex sort of extend that into a full circle, it places the centre of that circle somewhere round about here. 
Do you buy this as a model for a Bronze Age cemetery? Well, I do because there are many examples of cemeteries like this which you've got uh, an area surrounded by a ditch. And interestingly, if you look at the definition that Henry's put around this, all the kiss that we've got are within that circle. So I think, to me, that's a fairly good indicator. We've actually got the limits of this, of this cemetery. Around the big kist, there's a definite sense of anticipation. Everyone wants to see what lies beneath. But when you're dealing with large stone blocks that could collapse at any time and destroy the delicate remains below, you just can't rush. In the middle there, is that a separate stone? Yes, it, uh, this looks like a, a locking stone. What do you which, mean by that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of wedging um, the two stones together and, keep, and keeping the seal, keeping, keeping what's in here. In, you know, the, the whole of this crack that we've got here between the two stones was actually sealed together, which is why we've got this problem of some stuff in danger of falling in. Yeah. This one looks as if it's going to come away quite cleanly. My worry is there might be something underneath that's going to drop away as we do it, so yeah. I want to clean it quite carefully. Some bits of very modern looking material in there as well that are shiny, almost like they're tinfoil or all plastic. Make sure or this is all part of the Which is weird because it had the capping stone on top, so how could that have got in there? It doesn't make sense, does it? Could it be modern or could it just be old and it's caught the light? Tantalising. Okay. Let's see if this doesn't bite you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that, John. <laughs> really? Well, that is. That's what's shining, Margaret. So it is plastic, isn't it? It's a nest, isn't it? Oh, so rodents have introduced that then. That's what we were seeing. Extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. How on earth rodents could get into a stone lined tomb buried a metre below remains to be seen. Before we can lift the stone, we've got loads to do. The trench is extended so we can get the heavy lifting gear in, and the weather's not helping. Bubble wrap has been fed down the crack in the lid to protect against any possible rockfall, and padding is wrapped around the stone before the lifting straps are attached. It's more like heavy engineering than archaeology. The lifting of this huge stone is using up a lot of manpower and resources. It's almost four o'clock, and we've still got four kists to excavate. A few metres away from our big kist, Cat has at last found some archaeology in an otherwise empty grave. We've got a pot. Is it the same as the other one? No, it's slightly different. Kerry's was very ornate and ours is just very, very plain. Also, it's badly damaged along this side, which is a shame. Do you reckon these would have been pots which were specifically thrown in order to be part of the funeral, or would these just have been the ordinary pots from the kitchen that would have been put in with the buried person? It's a very good question, and it's something that we can't really be sure about. However, my own feeling is it's likely that these pots had a function out with the actual burial tradition, but then were given over completely to use here. Though we do see very similar styles in graves. Is there any particular um, form for the location of the pot within the grave? Well, there is a tendency to have the pot located close to the head, so usually that's the case. But equally, right in the middle of the grave at one side is also quite a common find, but it's usually at the middle or at the head. So we've got no head. <laughs> no head, as yet. <laughs> but Obviously, it's... this grave did contain a body, but it's just probably as a result of the soil conditions that the bone is almost completely gone. It looks like Francis's idea to open a trench across the cemetery is paying dividends. Phil's already found what looks like a pile of bones. All of a sudden, cremated bones. Cremated bones, you're right, yeah. And human at that, I'm sure, yeah. And of course, I mean, you know, this may not be, I don't know, it may not be a high status burial, it may not be associated with wonderful pots and beautiful yeah. objects, but nonetheless it's still a human, it's being. A human being. It's absolutely. still somebody who died from way back with a history. Yeah, absolutely. It's not all good news. At least four of the kists we've excavated have been completely empty or badly damaged. A probable combination of acid soil and centuries of being trashed by ploughing. At last, we're ready to lift the smaller of the two big stones. We've done everything we can to ensure that nothing falls into the grave, but we can't be absolutely sure. We've only got a few hours left. Get 
Lift it clear. Lift it clear. Can we see what we've got there? Yeah, let's um, let's lift the, the wood out and see what's there. Which way to take it? Take it this way. Okay, towards you, Tony. Okay. Do watch that crack. We're gonna have to be very, very gentle because as we lift the bubble wrap off, we want to make sure we don't dislodge anything that's in situ. So, yeah. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Look at that. Wow. Margaret, come and have a look. It's wonderful, isn't it? I've not seen any bone like this on this site so far. Tell us what you can see. Well, we've got the skull and it's, it's, it's lying on the top with the top of the head down. Um, the bottom of the skull and the maxilla, the upper jaw's all gone and most of the nose, but a little bit of the nose still survives and the frontal region the eye sockets still survive, so that's really, really good. So we might be able to determine sex by that if we don't get anything else. If we're lucky, the jaw will have fallen off somewhere and be amongst this, which will help us age as well. But here we've got the upper leg bones and the lower leg bones, um, which suggests the pelvis is over there. These are the knees. It's a crouch burial, which is what you'd expect in this type of um, funerary environment. A crouch burial just means that somebody's buried, buried on their side with their legs tucked up in front of them and arms probably tucked up as well. There seem to be lots of little shiny bits in there. What on earth could they be? Well, we, we found the remnants of a look, what looked like a rodent's nest and I think, you know, a mouse or something's gone in and taken plastic in with it. So even though this has been sealed up for 4,000 years yeah, yeah. or more, Rodents have managed to get their way right, down into yeah. it. So we're not the first living things to have seen inside this tomb after all. But Even uh, though we're the first humans. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I and mean, the bone survival is absolutely brilliant compared with what we've got elsewhere. Neil, what do we do with it now? Well, it's going to have to be clean. We, we've had a little bit of debris go in. We're going to have to clean very, very carefully indeed because not only have we got bone in situ, we've also almost certainly got some grave goods in situ too. So very, very gentle, sensitive cleaning. Oh, you really think there's a good chance that we'll have grave goods here? I'd be very surprised if there wasn't in a grave of this grandeur. I think it's a man as well. I'm just feeling this. It feels like, like there are good brow ridges. So I think it's probably a man. Before we can excavate the contents of the kist, there's the small matter of the other stone, which is absolutely rotten and has to be removed by hand. Yeah. Have to do yeah, this. Fine. Um, Look at that. Perfect. A few metres from our big kist, Alice has been quietly working on a small burial, which seems to contain grave goods and the best preserved skeletal remains we've found so far. Got a nice lot of teeth, Alice. Is there enough to give us a good age? Yes, yeah. We've got um, quite a few molars here. Uh, Is that the six? Yeah, that's the first molar, and there's a little bit of wear on a couple of the cusps there. But that's the that's third molar, and the crown is complete. So that sort of suggests early teens, I think. Yeah, well, at least 12 anyway, mm. isn't it? So yeah. that's good. I mean, can we tighten that up? What, what's going on with the pelvis? Is that fused? Yes, yeah. well, I'm really pleased about this because um, I thought the pelvis was going to be really fragmentary. You had this little bit of it here, yeah. um, which doesn't really tell us much at all. Um, but coming down onto the right part of the pelvis here, um, we've got a lump of the pubis. There's a lump as well, isn't it? Yeah, and that's an unfused yeah. epiphysis. So... So... That's pre-puberty then, isn't it? Yeah. So somebody between sort of 12 and 14-ish? Yeah, which is really, really nice, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, great. brilliant. It's really good. Amazingly, another child burial. The makeup of this cemetery is very odd and very rare for the Bronze Age. One adult male in a graveyard of children. Maybe the position of the cemetery and the landscape hold some clues. Stuart, why am I at the top of this tower? <laughs> Well, I think from here, Francis, you can get a very good idea of the, the cemetery in relation to the landscape around it. Oh, you can see the sea over there, look. 
You really do get a feeling for the shape of the landscape, you don't do, you? Don't, yeah, and and you, yeah. th they put this thing here for a reason, didn't they? That's right. I think yeah. we can now start to appreciate why this cemetery is where it is. I've yeah. been looking at where the other prehistoric sites are in the vicinity. You can see these red dots are where there are kissed cemeteries. You can see yeah. how they're all next to river valleys. Yeah. Here, our cemetery here is next to this big valley over here. That's, and that's that one there. That's right. Yeah. I think what we should be looking at here is a community, a settlement over here, and a cemetery here next yeah. to this river valley on the edge of their territory, as it were. Yeah. Much like Leven today. And we can see from here, we can see Leven, and we can see the churches in the background. Yeah. This is almost the precursor of, of modern Leven. In other words, the chap underneath that massive kiss that I revealed last night, mm -hmm. he's probably not a sort of big chieftain or a king or something like that. He's much more the equivalent of, of the local mayor. Or I that think that's a good thing. analogy, absolutely, yeah. 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 There's definitely a mayor. Look at those brow ridges. One of the slightly unnerving things about this is, is that it looks as though you've actually got blood vessels still on the inside of the skull, but in fact they're, they're rootlets. Ah. Mm -hmm. And right. of course they're really destructive because they, they leach mineral out of the bone and destroy it. They're all over the outside as well. Can you see here? Very, very tiny fine roots, almost like hair, on the outside of the bone. But is this where the, the rats or the rodents have been yeah, nibbling? Yeah, yeah. What we've had here is, you know, rats nesting in the grave and probably in the skull itself. And they, the young rats and possibly the older ones as well will have been sharpening their teeth on the bone. And you've got some lovely examples of teeth marks all around here, for example. Is it very common to see rats nesting in the way that they've been here? Well, it's the sort of thing you imagine from some 19th century Gothic novels, isn't it? Yeah. But um, I've actually never, ever seen a burial that's been thrown into such complete disarray by the activity of rodents. But there's bone being moved all over the place, bits of skull, you know, quite well dispersed from where the, the remains of the skull were lying. And the skull itself has been moved and turned over by these rats. They've been mice. playing football down there. They've been having they? a great time down there and as a consequence um, we haven't got much left of our chap, which is a great, great shame. It's six o'clock and we're rapidly running out of time. The ambitious trench across the centre of the site has to be abandoned without finding a central burial. We have to put all our manpower into excavating, recording and lifting any remaining grave goods and skeletal remains. Then the stone slabs have to be removed. We've learnt a huge amount from excavating this cemetery, and we've finally got the answer to a question that's been bothering us since day one. Are the black patches areas of burning? The answer's more geological than archaeological. Some of the patches are charcoal, but the rest, the stuff that Francis thought was ritual cleansing, is in fact degraded, bad quality coal outcrops, common in this part of Scotland. No wonder they didn't give Geophys a signal. Finally, after all of the bones are removed, it becomes apparent how and where the rats gained entry. But one mystery remains. Why, in a burial of this grandeur, are there no grave goods? Perhaps our theories of what constitutes high status need to be revised. Maybe pottery, imported flint and jet, jewellery and weapons were everyday objects in the Scottish Bronze Age and it was natural, organic things that were highly prized. Perhaps the occupant of our main burial was wrapped in furs and surrounded by leather and wooden objects, which unfortunately haven't survived. Douglas Spears and his team were later able to complete Francis's trench and in the process discovered a central kist, just where Francis said it would be. It turned out to be the burial of the boy with the jet necklace first found in 1944. He was the first person buried here around 2100 BC. Shortly after that, at least four other children were buried along with the middle-aged man under the domed capstone. Quite what relationship he had to the children, we'll never know. And why he merited such an impressive grave marker has been lost by the passage of 4,000 years.